Now, I thought I was a decent speaker until I started hearing the ones that came before me. So it's a tough act to follow with science, but I hope you'll bear with me. So the title of my talk, How Do You Hold a Dead Star in Your Hand? It sounds like it could be a really bad physics joke. How do you hold a dead star in your hand? Very carefully, perhaps. Or if you're a Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, it'd be much more literal. You don't, you'd be dead if you tried. <laughs> but I promise it's not a bad joke, and I will get to the end of the story and tell you how. So like most good stories, I want to begin at the beginning. So when I was a little girl, way back in the 1980s, I wanted to be an astronaut. I had a stellarium, and I would shine its light onto my bedroom ceiling and reach up and try to touch all the stars one by one. And though you could not drag me on a ride more exciting than the bumper cars, or even that exciting, my parents never dissuaded me. I had this little white space shuttle, and I would zoom it around my room with my Care Bears as my co-pilots. But fortunately, within about a year, I realized that with this queasy stomach, being an astronaut was not the job for me. But I kept that lesson, reach for the stars. So fast forward to about 1998, and I found myself here, working for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Not something that I expected to do, but I was really thrilled at the chance. Now, the Chandra X-ray Observatory studies the X-ray universe. It is a NASA great observatory, and it's a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope, which some of you might have heard of before. But when you start working for a NASA mission, it probably sounds like it's pretty exciting. When you start working for a major NASA observatory about a year, before it's due to launch, it is nail-biting exciting. The scientists, the technologists, the engineers, the program managers, they have spent their careers building this cutting-edge piece of equipment that needs to withstand the rigors of a space launch. It gets a boost into its orbit that takes it about a third of the way to the moon at its farthest distance from Earth. And once it's in that harsh environment of space, it had to work perfectly because it would be too far for any crew of astronauts to ever give it a checkup. But it worked beautifully. Now, the Chandrix or Observatory studies really cool things, the high energy universe, such things as colliding galaxies and merging black holes, exploding stars. Also, Things like baby stars, stellar nurseries, planets in our solar system, and well beyond. Clusters of galaxies that are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. So a pretty wide spectrum of things. Now, at this point, I want to take a little step back and talk about how in astronomy we have a lot of information to work with, typically, if we're lucky and we have a lot of different kinds of light. So just one NASA mission, the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, which studies our sun in many different kinds of light, it collects about 50 Blu-ray disks of data each day. So if you stack those disks one on top of each other by the end of a year, you have a stack taller than the average NBA basketball player, something perhaps a little over seven feet tall. And that's just one mission. That's one mission worth of data to sort of sort through, work through, and translate. Now, also in astronomy, we have the full electromagnetic spectrum, all the types of light from radio waves to gamma rays. And you're probably familiar with some of these types of light here on Earth. If you've ever perhaps gotten an x-ray at the dentist, or perhaps you have used a microwave to heat up your food. Or if you've put sunscreen on your skin in order to protect it from ultraviolet radiation. Now, you need very specialized detectors and sensors to look at all of these different kinds of light, so there is not a one size that fits all. 
And when you have so many different observatories, I've been asked, is it kind of like having a different sports car, one for each day of the week? Are astronomers really, really that lucky? And we're gonna do a quick visualization exercise to think about it and to think it through. So, if you close your eyes for just a second, and just imagine an alien has landed on your doorstep. Now, I'm not saying aliens exist. If I did, I would be in a whole heap of trouble. But just pretend an alien has landed on your doorstep. Now, everyone got that picture in their head? Yeah? Okay. So, your alien friend, for some reason, wants to experience American culture. So you decide to take your new alien friend to Fenway Park. You sit down in your tiny seats, you grab your salty popcorn, you look out on the field, and for some reason, this is all your alien friend can see. Can anyone tell me what it is? Anyone recognize it? It's the third baseline. Yeah, I heard someone. Cool, you get an A. So, if your alien friend knows nothing about baseball and is looking at this, he, she, it, would have a very hard time figuring out the rules of the game. What's going on? How many players? Uh, is there a ball? Are there teams? How do I know what's happening? Now, if your alien friend could see the entire baseball field, all of the information, he, she, it, would have a slightly easier time figuring out the rules of the game. Now, the analogy here to astronomy is that if we could only see with the type of light that our eyes have evolved to see, visible light or optical light, then it would be kind of like being only able to see down that third base line. We would be missing so much information. So when we can see the whole playing field, when we can see the whole universe, we have a much better shot. Now, just like in baseball, there are gonna be mysteries that I'll never figure out but we have a much better chance once we're presented with all the information. So at this point, I want to narrow the story down a little further and tell you about my favorite object in the entire universe. Who here has a favorite object in the universe? I'm sure I'm not the only one, right? It might sound a little crazy, kind of like a mother picking her favorite child, which, though my kids would probably each claim that privilege, I would never do but I have a sort of cosmological crush on this one object called Cassiopeia A. What's its backstory? Well, a star in our galaxy, but still far, far away, got old, ran out of fuel, and eventually collapsed and exploded. Now, when it exploded, it sort of spewed its guts out into the universe. But I have a quick sort of spoiler alert for you at this point. And you probably try avoid spoilers like the plague whenever a Star Wars movie comes out or after any episode of The Walking Dead. I know we run away, but you're my prisoners here, so you have no choice. So the spoiler is that this has a happy ending because it's not about the death of the star. It's about the transformation, the translation or the transgalactic migration of light. So we get to work with that information. Now, if we look at an image of Cassiopeia A, or for those who are good friends, Cass A for short, this image is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, it shows beautiful, delicate filamentary structure around the 10,000 degrees Celsius mark. This supernova remnant is about 10,000 light years away from us, give or take, where one light year is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers, give or take. So to simplify the math, 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, and that tells you how far it is. It's about 10 light years across. And so multiply 10 times 10 trillion kilometers, and you get the idea of how big it is. So if we look at this patch of sky with the Chandrakshar Observatory, same field of view, we get a much different picture. Death comes alive. So now we are looking at material that is millions of degrees hot. And we can combine the two images, get a little better picture of our universe or our playing field, so to speak. Now, images of the universe, they don't start out looking like this. They look a little more like this, but really, they look like this. No one can make sense of that, unless you're a computer. 
So when a satellite such as Chandra observes an object in space, the photons, the packets of energy that make up electromagnetic radiation, they've been traveling. And so the Chandra X observatory will be pointed at its target and it will record those photons. It'll bundle them up into the form of ones and zeros, send it down to Earth through NASA's deep space network before eventually it makes its way to our computers at the Chandra X-ray Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now at that point, we still have to translate the information. So we have a table of data to work with that has the time, the energy, the position of each of the photons, those little packets of energy that struck the detector while it was looking at this one object. At that point, we still have to clean it, remove any artifacts, composite it, uh, crop it. And our last step, when we translate it into the visual representation of the object, is to add color, because inherently, it doesn't have color on its own. Now, when we're adding color, it's not paint by numbers, I promise. We're not coloring with our crayons. We use the data to tell the story of the science. So we might want to talk about the topographical feature that we're interested in, or perhaps the chemical composition, or the energy or temperature levels that we're looking at, kind of like a weather map on the nightly news. Right? So we can, in this case, for our good friend Cassiopeia A, Cass A for short, we can apply color based on energy level. So we split the image into three and apply low energies to red, medium energy x-rays to green, highest energy to blue. Composite the three together, chromatic ordering, RGB, kind of like our eyes see, and we get a full color image. Now, the color tells us important stuff. The blue wispy arcs in the image are showing us the acceleration of the shock. The red, the green materials are showing us the dead stuff that's been heated to millions of degrees. So it adds to the information quotient of the image. Now, we can do better. We can go from a 2D static image to a 2D image that changes over time. So again, this is my favorite object in the whole entire universe. And Chandra has looked at it for, well, about 30 days worth of observations across the 17 years of its mission. So we can look at it by time. And we can look at subsets of data from 2000, 2002, 2004, and 2007 and see it expanding. Now again, our friend Cass A, 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion, and we're seeing it expand, which is pretty cool. But we can do more. We take that data from Chandra, we add it to our good friends, infrared data from the Spitzer Space Telescope and optical data from ground-based observatories, and we can create the first ever three-dimensional model of the data of an exploded star that's 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion. Now, if the image here looks a little like a brain, you've got good vision because it was actually created using software developed from the Astronomical Medicine Project at Harvard that created their software for astronomers based on software from brain imaging science. So hence, our exploded star brain. So what we did is we took it into a commercial package, the same data, it's still real, we had a little more control of the colors and the textures and the camera angles, and we created this. And it is a beautiful shot showing above, behind, underneath, and through an exploded star, our good friend Cassiopeia A, Cass A for short, 10,000 light years away in three dimensions. Now, just like with the time data I showed you previously, we learned something there. We learned that the velocity of that outer blast wave is about 11 million miles per hour. That's the expansion. So that's 17, 18 million kilometers per hour. And with the 3D model, we're learning that the way the star explodes is pretty interesting. The outer layers puff off in a very spherical sense. And the inner layers come off differently, more disk-like, with high-velocity jets in multiple directions. So astronomers who create models of stars learn something when they look at their data in a new way. But we weren't done yet. 
one more translation, transformation of this transgalactic migration we had to do. With our friends at the Smithsonian, we created the first ever 3D print of an exploded star, Cassiopeia A, Cassie for short, 10,000 light years away, 10,000 times 10 trillion, give or take. And now we can hold a dead star in our hand. So, thank you. <laughs> I want to hold this with two hands because it's special. So it's been 30 years since I was zooming that space shuttle around my bedroom. And though my feet are obviously quite firmly planted on the ground, this gets me close to the cosmos, but without the long distance commute. So if you have access to a 3D printer in your makerspace, library, school, you too can hold a dead star in your hand. The files that we use to create this are available free online. You can search Chandra Casse 3D, and you should be able to find it pretty easily. I'll just finish by saying two things. One, we care about things like exploded stars because the seeds for life, the elements that we need, are created in their furnaces. And when they explode and spew their guts out into the universe, they are eventually swept up and create the new generations of stars, of planets, of stuff. So the iron in our blood, the calcium in our bones, the gold in our jewelry, assuming it's real, they come from those previous generations of stars. And my final thought is that science and technology being so very collaborative, there are so many people involved in the process of translation, our transformation and our transgalactic migration of light, from the scientists, the engineers, the technologists who work on the observatories, the communications of the data, the principal investigator who requested all this data of Cassiopeia A, our good friend Cass A for short, and my own team that worked very hard to get a model that looked this cool for this stage. So I'll just end by saying the universe is yours to discover, and I hope you'll reach out and touch the stars. Thank you.